According to ClarifyChristianity.com, the Bible is not a science book, yet it is scientifically accurate. We are not aware of any evidence that contradicts the Bible. I guess they have a pretty loose interpretation of scientific evidence. The Bible Describes Dinosaurs The book of Job, chapters 40 and 41, supposedly describe dinosaurs. It starts off pretty strong in Job 40, describing behemoth. Its tail sways like a cedar. The sinews of its thighs are close-knit. Its bones are tubes of bronze, its limbs like rods of iron. Sounds like a big-ass dinosaur to me. That is, until we get to Job 40, 21 through 22. Under the lotus plants it lies, hidden among the reeds in the marsh. The lotuses conceal it in their shadow. Not exactly sure how an 80-foot-tall sauropod is going to hide in a patch of 5-foot-tall plants. And Job 41 talks about Leviathan, mostly about how huge and powerful it is. But the specifics refer to fearsome teeth and two rows of shields tightly sealed together. Very dinosaurish so far. But then we get to descriptions like its snorting throws out flashes of light, and flames stream from its mouth. Add to that the statements, It makes the depths churn like a boiling cauldron, and it leaves a glistening wake behind it. And we're no longer talking about dinosaurs. The Bible frequently refers to the great number of stars in the heavens. Here are two examples. Genesis 22:17. I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. Jeremiah 33:22. As the host of heaven cannot be numbered, nor the sand of the sea measured, so I will multiply the descendants of David my servant and the Levites who minister to me. Wow, that's freaky. The Bible actually points out there's a shitload of sand on the beach and a shitload of stars in the sky. Pointing out the obvious does not count as being scientifically accurate, and just because we don't have an exact number doesn't mean they can't be numbered. It just means that back then somebody probably started counting and then went, fuck it, I gotta go sacrifice a goat or something. The Bible describes the suspension of earth in space. Job 26, 7 He stretches out the north over empty space. He hangs the earth on nothing. Well, given the other explanations, such as a giant turtle or the Greek titan Atlas, this one might almost get a pass. Except you know what else the Bible says? Psalm 104, 5 He set the earth on its foundations. It can never be moved. Since the Earth moves around the Sun at about 67,000 miles per hour, I'm going to have to say this one is shit, too. The Bible says blood is essential to life. Leviticus 17, 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. Yeah, there's a real stroke of genius. Let's see here. Bob just got gored to shit by one of those rogue bulls from Exodus 21. All that red sticky stuff fell out of him, and he died. Hey man, write this down. Blood is important. Keep it inside you. Now, if this passage had mentioned something about white blood cells fighting off infection, or red blood cells carrying oxygen from the lungs, it might have a little more credence. But as is, it's just another statement of the obvious. The Bible includes some principles of fluid dynamics. Job 28.25 To establish a weight for the wind, and apportion the waters by measure. Yeah, this one almost got me too, except several versions such as the NIV or the NLT refer to force. Pretty big fucking difference from weight. Not to mention, at least according to Google Translate, the Hebrew word for weight can also mean importance. Again, pretty big difference. I would have to wonder how reliable a book really is when there are so many versions which are this different.
The Bible describes the chemical nature of flesh. Genesis 2, 7 And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. This one works if you're going to accept Carl Sagan's statement that we are made of star stuff. But we all know that the Bible is not talking about the Big Bang and abiogenesis and evolution. No, this passage states that God literally took a handful of dirt, breathed on it, and poof, it became a man. Not very scientific, and not describing the chemical nature of a damn thing. The Bible includes reasonably complete descriptions of the hydrologic cycle, Job 36, 27 through 28. For he draws up drops of water, which distill as rain from the mist, which the clouds drop down and pour abundantly on man. Well done. I'd call this reasonably complete. Now, is it something that no one would have figured out were it not for the Bible? Of course not. A few seasons of observing clouds rolling in, dropping rain, then those puddles disappearing after a few days might just lead one to the same conclusion. Except we know that he isn't drawing up shit. Between radiant heat from the sun and convection from the wind, those drops of water are drawing up just fine without God's help. Hydrothermal vents are described in two books of the Bible written before 1400 BC, more than 3,000 years before their discovery by science. Genesis 7:11, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day all the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. Job 38:16, Have you entered the springs of the sea, or have you walked in search of the depths? If you're going to choose a statement to demonstrate science, it's probably best not to use one that talks about a 600-year-old man. Nevertheless, hydrothermal vents are not fountains of the deep capable of submerging every living thing on Earth under five miles of water. Matter of fact, they don't even add water to the ocean. They're just the result of ocean water seeping through cracks in the ocean floor, being reheated by magma and venting back out. Seriously. Why does the Bible not mention the high concentrations of hydrogen sulfide or the unusual creatures that actually live around these things? And since I'm often accused of taking things out of context, I read Job 38 in its entirety. And in context, the implication is that the springs created the oceans. But seriously, go read Job 38. God's being a sarcastic bitch. Now these last two come from Ray Comfort's Living Waters website. I saved the worst for last, I guess. Medical science has only recently discovered that blood clotting in a newborn reaches its peak on the eighth day, then drops. The Bible consistently says that a baby must be circumcised on the eighth day. Leviticus 12.3 On the eighth day, the boy is to be circumcised. So this one's complete horseshit. Even if we ignore the discussion about whether or not circumcision is even necessary, I found absolutely nothing to back up the claim that blood clotting peaks on the eighth day then drops. The closest thing I was able to find was an article from the National Institute of Health that stated, classical VKDB, vitamin K deficiency related bleeding, occurs between 24 hours and 7 days of life and is associated with delayed or insufficient feeding. The article also states, the hemostatic system is not fully mature until 3 to 6 months of age. So, no, it does not drop after eight days. The Bible talks about washing in running water. Encyclopedia Britannica documents that in 1845, a young doctor in Vienna named Dr. Ignaz Semmelweis Semmelweis was horrified at the terrible death rate of women who gave birth in hospitals. Semmelweis noted that the doctors would examine the bodies of patients who died, then, without washing their hands, go straight to the next ward and examine expectant mothers. This was their normal practice because the presence of microscopic diseases was unknown. Semmelweis insisted that the doctors wash their hands before examinations and the death rate immediately dropped to 2%. Look at the specific instructions God gave his people for when they encounter disease. 
And when he that has an issue is cleansed of his issue, then he shall number to himself seven days for his cleansing, and wash his clothes, and bathe his flesh in running water, and shall be clean. Until recent years, doctors washed their hands in a bowl of water, leaving invisible germs on their hands. However, the Bible specifically says to wash hands under running water. So the first part about Dr. Semmelweis is true. He did encourage doctors to wash the cadaver particles off their hands, but it would be years before the germ theory was actually accepted. Now, Leviticus says to wash in running water, which seems like sound advice. But Ray seems to have neglected the rest of the chapter. Talk about taking things out of context. First of all, the issue to which Leviticus refers is also described as an unusual discharge. Sounds to me like an STD or a urinary tract infection. The following verses up to verse 13 basically instruct anyone who comes in contact with either the man or anything he touches to wash themselves and their clothes and says they will be unclean till evening. While it's still a good idea to clean up after being in contact with an infected person, what's the obsession with evening? Is there something magical that happens after the sun goes down? Verses 14 and 15 go on to say that once the discharge has stopped, Captain Syphilis is supposed to take a couple of pigeons to a priest to have them sacrificed and set on fire. Because, you know, science. And the rest of the chapter basically prescribes the same treatment to any man who ejaculates, or a woman on her period. You can't mix a little bit of good practice with a whole lot of fucktartery and call it science. This one might have almost gotten a pass if it, I don't know, mentioned something about germs. So that's it, my response to 10 of the supposed scientific facts in the Bible. Don't forget, if you enjoyed this video, click like, subscribe, and please support me on Patreon. Links below.